I can't help it. I love the Apostle John. I mean, it'll be wrong. I, I, I like all the disciples. But there's something about John. I mean, those of you that know me, you know how much I've studied the book of Revelation. Like, you're probably like, oh, surprise, surprise. But, but it's not even just the book of Revelation. It's, it's John. There's something about John that my heart resonates with. There's something about John that I feel connected with. There's something about John that I think deep down simply gives me hope. Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse 9, is a passage that, 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 that it's easy to overlook and that, that, that it's easy to, to brush on by, but, but, but there's a story embedded in this. A story of hope, a story of redemption, a story of transformation. Revelation chapter 1, 9 says, I, John, your brother and companion in suffering and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. Every element of that is packed full of redemption. I, John, your brother, your companion in the suffering and in the kingdom and in the patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. Here's why this passage overwhelms me. Here's why this passage gives me hope. Here's why this passage compels me to just simply say, I love John. Because this is a person who in the Gospels was anything but calling those around him brother and companion or even equal. This is a person that in the Gospels was, was a bigot, was an arrogant jerk. I mean, as a matter of fact, uh, let's just take out one of those shining moments for John. John ch or Luke chapter 9, verses 51 and following. It says, As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, a, a, a turning point in the Gospel of Luke. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. I don't know if you know this, but the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. They have a long history of, of sabotaging each other, of, of actually putting them in the way of Rome, of getting each other killed by the Roman authorities, of taking bones and scattering them in holy places to desecrate them. The Jews and the Samaritans hated each other, so much so that typically a kosher Jew, if they were going from Galilee up north, to Jerusalem down south, would actually cross the Jordan River, go down, and then cross the other side of the Jordan River just so they wouldn't have to go into Samaria in the middle. They hated each other. Jesus sends messengers on ahead, verse 52, who go into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him, but the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. The animosity between the Jews and between the Samaritans runs deep. But notice how James and John respond. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? To destroy those wretched Samaritans? Like, have you ever wondered why Jesus chose the Samaritan to be the hero in his parable, the Good Samaritan? It's because it shocked his audience so intensely. Because the Jews never would have looked at Samaritans as heroes, as those more devout to God than them. They were the half-breeds. They were the problem. They were the impure ones, the sacrilege. And what James and John are asking for is what a lot of the Jews would have thought the Samaritans believed. But James and John are the ones that vocalized it. They vocalized the bigotry. They vocalized the discrimination. Do you want us to call down fire on these half-breeds? Because Jesus, you say the word, we'll snap the fingers, and God will wipe them out. Just like Elijah and the prophets of Baal, he'll wipe them out. That's John. John, the son of thunder, who also, it's not just Samaritans outsiders he's willing to sacrifice or to undercut or attack. It's even the very other disciples themselves. Mark chapter 10. Jesus and his disciples are walking along the road whenever James and John sidle up next to Jesus and they say, hey, we have, we have a request. Will you do anything that we ask? 
Which, that's pretty bold. Whatever we, and then Jesus, like, whatever we ask of you, Lord, will you please just do it? And Jesus says, well, what do you want? Let one of us sit at your right hand and one at your left hand in glory. Why? Because Jesus, come on. We're the greatest. I mean, let's be honest here. We have 12 disciples, which puts us ahead above everyone else. And then out of those 12 disciples, you have three that get to do everything. Transfiguration, resurrection of the widow of Nain. I mean, I mean, resurrection of the, of, the, of the child. The inner three are the ones that get to see all this. And out of the inner three, let's be honest, Peter... Peter is going to outdo James and John, us two? Come on, Peter's always put his foot... You had to call him Satan not too long ago. Now, out of the end of three, it's one of us two. So why don't you just go ahead and just do it? We're the greatest. Just say the word. This is John. An arrogant bigot. And yet, this is the same disciple that when he wrote an entire gospel, never once does he mention his own name. Why? Because when you fall in love with Jesus, transformation is inevitable. See, it's one of the most powerful things that the early church boasted about. The early church would talk about not, not all these rational syllogisms of how to argue people into the kingdom. What the church talked about, their number one evangelistic tactic, was pointing to people that had been transformed through the gospel. Athanasius in his early 3rd century, 4th century writing, where he's writing, it's called On the Incarnation. He says, liars come into the church and they walk out faithful. Adulterers come into the church and they walk out faithful. Murderers walk into the church and they walk out lovers of everyone. It was transformation. And when I read Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, what I am reminded of is the transformation that happens in John. Where John may be in the Gospels is calling down fire from heaven on the Samaritans. He may be fighting for the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He may be undercutting those on the inside or on the outside of the kingdom. But after years of living with Christ, he doesn't mention his name in his own Gospel. And here in Revelation, when he does mention his own name, it sounds like this. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. I love this verse because this verse gives me hope. Hope that I can be different. Hope that I can transform. Hope that as I press into Jesus, he will erode the rough edges of my soul he will eradicate the arrogance of my heart. And he will allow me to be as humble and as gracious as John himself. My challenge for you this week is to recommit yourself to transformation. To ask the Spirit to search your heart. And to eradicate any of the arrogance, the bigotry, the wounds, the sins that we keep hidden, and to allow the great healer to heal. Listen, it will hurt, but I'm glad to be able to say that we are brothers and sisters and companions in the suffering of the kingdom and the patient endurance that are ours in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. May it be so. Love you guys. Talk to you next week.